please welcome Dave Gorman. Hello, sir. Hello, oh. So, it strikes me you'd be the perfect uh, dinner guest. Um... Because you've got the stories. Yeah, but I don't eat meat. I'm a real pain in the arse as a dinner guest. Frozen you have to problems. say in advance, I don't eat meat, and then they resent you slightly. <laughs> Unless you're friends of vegetarians, I mean. Well, yeah, yeah, I do have some friends who are, but generally you're an annoying dinner guest. So I, I'd rather have people round to ours for dinner where we can cook their meat, and, and they suddenly go, oh, you don't have any moral objection. You go, no, I couldn't give a fuck about the animals. I just feel better not eating meat. That's interesting. And that's much nicer. So you happy? I find that because I'm, I'm vegetarian. Oh, yeah, okay. The, yeah, yeah. The, the wife is vegetarian, but so you you're happy to is is, is your partner vegetarian? Uh, no, my wife is not. Uh, she eats meat, and you can put your own rude joke in there if you like. <laughs> um, uh, but but no no she eats she eats meat. Okay. So yes, let's do proper interview stuff. Okay. You started out as you got your early success as a writer. Would that be accurate? Um, uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I was on the circuit. For, I started doing stuff when I was nineteen. Um, so when, when was that? Uh, I'm 42 now, so oh. I don't know. Well, yes, yeah. 1990-ish. Yeah. Um, uh, I was at university and I dropped out um, and I started doing stand-up. And I was in Manchester. There was a very small number of people. It's, it's changed enormously. There was, only, there was one club in Manchester at the time. It was on weekly and they would give you no more than two gigs a year. So all my open spots were done in Leicester and Nottingham and Sheffield and Birmingham and just sort of travelling all over the country. But there was a very small... We started doing a, a new material night in Manchester. Um, and initially, I was deemed too young and inexperienced and wasn't allowed to play with the big boys. And the big boys were uh, Steve Coogan, John Thompson, a guy called Henry Normal, uh, who was a brilliant act, and he now runs Steve Coogan's production company with him. Uh, there was a guy called Bob Dillinger. Um, and we basically had one of everything in Manchester. Bob Dillinger was a guitar act. Henry Normal was a, a stand-up poet. Carolina Hearn was doing characters. Steve Coogan was doing um, impressions. Uh, and, and so was John. Like, there, was, there weren't sort of many people crossing over with each other's stuff. And after about four weeks of them doing a new material weekly night, they went, we can't write any more material. We need somebody else on board. Uh, and so I got asked, oh, you're right. We'll let you do it. And I was like 19 and just mad keen. I just think, this is fucking brilliant. Look, I'm working with these professionals. This is amazing. And nobody was more motivated to write than me. They all had lots of other work and were quite busy. And I, was, I had nothing other than that one gig a week. So I started doing that. And then Steve gave me bits of writing work because basically he had a weekly demonstration that I was there producing stuff. And then Caroline asked me to do stuff. So I, I ended up being the sort of um, the, the Pete Best of the, the writing team on the Mrs. Merton show. Who, who else was on that one? Uh, well, Caroline herself was, was, you know, she wrote the vast majority of it. A guy called Craig Cash, who's always worked with her, uh, and Henry Normal. Uh, they, they'd already sort of worked together. They did the pilot together, and then when they got the series, uh, they asked somebody else to come along. So I, I was sort of junior member, tugging my forelock in their direction. Uh, but that was, you know, a, a wonderful experience, because I was probably like 23, 24 or something by the time that was going on, um, and the show was... It went... I mean, it's a ridiculous ride. Uh, the first series was Late Night BBC Two. The second series was Primetime BBC Two. The third series was BBC One. And it just like, leapfrogged up the, in this kind of public consciousness. And it was an amazing thing to watch Caroline because she knows her mind. She's fucking brilliant. She's also incredibly stupid in lots of ways. But she's, <laughs> she, and I love her to pieces, but she did once genuinely ask me, is Hitler dead? <laughs> How do you not know that? And yet you know all these other things and you know your audience incredibly well. Um, and, and that's part of it. Those two things are sort of connected. But watching her handle TV people was really instructive because there, there was a thing we had um, Patrick Litchfield, Queen's cousin and photographer, as a guest. Uh, and what we, you know, we were always like, we, don't get another weatherman, we've done all the weather jokes. Just get one per we, we weren't really writing about the person. We were writing jokes about what the public knew of their job. And we had this thing in the, the Patrick Litchfield show where she'd ask him for advice on photography. And, and she'd just got these old photos. And we're saying, what do you think about that one? And we just found some old photos from her family that were awful, just like her aunts at the seaside. And, and, and there was one that you didn't know what it was. It was really out of focus. And, and she showed it to him, and he went, what on earth is that? And the audience were laughing at that. And then after, at the end of it, the director was going, can we just get a cutaway over your shoulder where we see the photo? And he was going, no. No, you can't. 
And TV people do that thing where they go, well, just let us take the cutaway, and then if we need it in the edit, we've got it. She's going, no, I'm not letting you have it, because if you've got it, you will use it. And she wouldn't let them say it. She understood the joke was funnier with us not knowing what the photo was. Mm -hmm. And I think you sort of see that later on in their work with the royal family when they're peering out of a window and talking about the neighbour's car. You don't see it. You you don't get to see it. You see three or four arses looking out of a window. And she was really strong about those things. And I I, I was there studying that going... Yeah, that's that's the right way to be. Stick mm. up for yourself. You know, that was a really, a um, really, really formative lesson early yeah, on. Yeah. So, were you still doing stand up uh, while you were writing? Yeah, I was. Um, the reason I ended up with the agent I did, uh, Caroline hated live work. The minute she could afford not to do live work, she stopped it. She used to like be really nervous. And we were writing on something else. There was an awful sketch show uh, called The Full Monty. I think what had happened is, is Granada had given, had made a pilot with Steve Coogan, John Thompson and Carolina Hearn and then not commissioned it, but they had the option on it. And then Steve had become huge and then Granada tried to option it and Steve went, no, I'm buying myself out of this contract. So now they've spent quite a lot of money on Caroline and John. They had to do something. So they just commissioned this weird hodgepodge of a sketch show and they had three different producers and one person was putting like performance art and juggling in and one person was trying to make an ITV sort of Saturday night show and one person was trying to make an edgy BBC2 show and it was all over the place uh, and we were all writing on that and, and Caroline was meant to be going to do a gig in Hebden Bridge that night uh, with Stuart Lee and she was in the office going, oh Dave will you go for me will you do the gig I, said, I can't do they're expecting Sister Mary Immaculate and none they're expecting a character. They're expecting you. Can't no. And you have that's who's been. But oh, go on, please do it. You you like doing live gigs. I don't like doing live gigs. Dave. So I can't do it because the agent won't pay me because you're the person who's been booked. It's your job. She went. I'll pay you. She got a checkbook out and wrote me a check for 125 pounds. <laughs> so right, fine. I'll get in the car and I went to Hebden Bridge. Uh, Stuart Lee the next day was going to be filming on the TV show, so I. I did the gig with him and then gave him a lift back to Manchester where he stayed at a friend's house and he gave a, a glowing report of that gig to the man who then became my, my manager down the line. So by, by freak circumstance uh, and by still doing gigs and by being uh, Caroline's pet, uh, <laughs> which is, I think, what I was, I ended up um, in, with a manager who I'm still with today. Nice. Yeah, yeah, all those years later. So how do we get from doing stand-up and not being Caroline Ahern yeah. to the storytelling, the narrative stuff that you're known for. I, I think with performing, it's all... You, you explore things until you reach a dead end and then you go back and just go and do something else. And I've had so many different weird sort of incarnations. When I was, I was 19, I hadn't lived, I had nothing to talk about. What I had was a bit of a smart-ass way with words. It was sort of jokes that could be done if you went through a, a dictionary with a, a computer programme. You know, there was no heart and soul in it. Because I was 19, didn't have anything. Um, and, and I was massively influenced by John Hegley. Mm. I, I was a huge fan. I used to go to the Edinburgh... I, I lived in Stafford when I was growing up. There was, no, there was never one comedy gig in my whole t- teenage years in that town. So me and a mate used to go up to Edinburgh and see six shows a day and sleep in the back of a transit van uh, for a week. That was our holiday. And we'd feast on culture. And comedy was a thing that completely lit my bulb. And you'd say, oh, that's amazing. I want to do that when I'm older. Um, uh, and Hegley was, was my god, I thought he was amazing. And at 19, I was doing an act um, that was like a stand up poetry thing, uh, where main, the main punchline is, and now I'm turning the page. Um, you, know, you didn't realise that was over. That's your cue that it's over. That's sort of I, I'm, I'm awful. And I'm not, not proud of any of it. I revived one thing a couple of years ago. Uh, it was very earnest. It really only works if you've got a notepad, because that is the sort of prop. It, 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 it was all very mock earnest, saying. Uh, This poem is called Innocence. Jordan is innocent. Gary is innocent. Doreen is innocent. Sarah is innocent. This poem is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. (laughs) Um, And it 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 was a bit pompous and a bit weird. Uh, and it was deadpan because that way uh, they couldn't hurt me. I was 19 and I thought, if I look like I don't care, then when it goes badly, they think I didn't care and then they haven't hurt me. And then I realised as I was going, actually, that if you show them that you care, it doesn't go badly. Yeah. 
You know, like, to be, by protecting yourself, you actually make it more likely to be the thing you don't want it to be. And by showing that you are working and you care and you're doing this for people, they, they go on side with you. But at the same time, and I, I was thinking about this because I knew it was coming today, obviously. I can't work out why I was doing this. At 19, my first act had this deadpan sort of mock serious poetry and juggling in it. <laughs> it genuinely did. I used to juggle sink plungers. I... I I, I credit myself with one thing at the age of 19. I was smart enough. I, I never did the juggling of sink plungers. If I was only doing a short, if I was doing 10 minutes, I wouldn't do it. I'd only do it if I was doing 20 minutes, and I'd do it after 15 minutes of, of sort of relatively cerebral things, and then make sure I had the time for sort of two minutes at the end as well. So I, I was never perceived as, oh, yeah, that was the act to do the sink plungers. And I got offered two or three times people wanted me to do that bit on TV, and even at the age of 19, when I'd never done TV, I was going, no, I'm not... I'm not pigeonholing myself as that guy. Yeah. The minute I'd done one thing on TV, and I used to stick the sink plungers to my tits uh, and things and do awful jokes about looking like Madonna or something, you know, I was 90, whatever. Um, And at least I had the wherewithal, I think, to to not not let them make that who I was. Yes. Uh, I I sort of knew there was more (gasps) over the horizon. Uh, And I I, I was doing that for a while. I'll tell you, I have actually brought, I bought some sink plungers this afternoon because I felt like I'm not really singing for my supper just sitting here talking to you. Uh, so we can have a go at something. But in answer to your question about sort of how do you get from there, you go on, you reach a dead end. I was doing this act that was so highly influenced by John Hegley. Uh, and at the same time, I was doing these new material nights in Manchester with this gang of people. Uh, and this promoter in Manchester offered me a gig um, in Stockport supporting John Hegley. And I said, you can't book me for that. That will be embarrassing. I will be the subpar John Hegley before. One, he'll hate it. What a terrible thing to turn up and find a support act who clearly wants to be you. <laughs> How embarrassing is that? So you can't... He, and he was like, no, no, I really want you to do it. And I really needed the money. So I said yes to it, and I shook his hand, and I said, but I won't do any poetry. I will jettison that act before then. And I had, like, a month. And in that month, I wrote a, my first set that was just stand-up. And, and then... Because I was just... I couldn't go on before John being a shit John. Um, and from that day on, I never did any of it again. I did it with him, and it, what I, you know, a new kind of act, and that worked. And so I did that for a few years, and I reached a dead, a dead end with that, and I thought, oh, I can't be doing this, and I tried something else. And, and, and going to Edinburgh, most people go to Edinburgh, and they do a sort of an extended version of their club set. In Edinburgh, you're risking tens, you know, 10, 15,000 pounds. I thought, what the fuck am I going to Edinburgh doing a thing hoping to be seen by some TV executives who live in London and could see me doing this five nights a week in London. And I had a, 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 a meal with my manager where I said, I'm never going to do stand-up in Edinburgh again. I'm gonna, if I'm going to risk all that money, I should risk doing something that might be shit but might be brilliant. Uh, and I told him I was going to do a whole show about the song Reasons to be Cheerful by Ian Jury. Uh, and he said, you're fucking mad. We'll preview it in March so that you've got chance to pull out. Uh, and we previewed it in March, and he went, pull out. And I went, no, I'm not. Uh, and, I get, and, and from that moment on, I did that show that kind of wasn't a stand-up show, was a kind of narrative thing. And the minute I did that, I said, I'm not doing stand-up again. And he said, you've got some bills to pay. And I went, all right, the minute I can afford to not do stand-up, I'm, not, I'm doing this instead. Yeah. I did sort of three of those shows, and by the time I'd done the third, I could afford to get rid of stand-up because people were booking me for those shows then. So, and it's always, it's a constant, you do it until you reach a block and go, oh, this isn't fun anymore, I'm going to pick up a new toy and, and do mm. that. But would you like to see the first toy, which was the sink plungers? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 I don't know if I, I generally don't know if I can do it, okay. but I'm not a proper juggler and I'm not taking a fucking custard pie. Oh, come on, you're no so, fun. <laughs> so, you can't make me do that. I show my rules. And I brought, I, I brought um, six. Oh. And I'll tell you what, I, I generally See, have to if go... If I in, can't juggle these now, I, but you can, this is... I, I went into a shop today and bought these and she was really freaked out, because... <laughs> <laughs> what kind of blockage have you got? <laughs> Well, you need that. Um, so, uh, and obviously, you can do more impressive things than I with this. And I, I, genuinely, I worry, genuinely, for the front row, these are wood and they are hard, and I'm not a professional juggler. So, do genuinely be, it might be a Cristiano Ronaldo. I don't want to break anyone's wrist. Um, if I... This one's already got custard on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, where did that come it's from? It's everywhere. Yeah, that stage. clearly. It's everywhere. So, I don't know if I, I genuinely, I, I practiced once in the <clears> corridor and it didn't go well. Yeah. Genuinely, I'm not, a, I'm not a juggler. But at the end, when you're 19 and you've got nothing else to do but a gig in two weeks' time, you get quite good at this if you, you know, really apply yourself. 
Uh, but... Look at that. <laughs> ah! Ah, that. A spotlight, spotlight. See, no, spotlights no, I... are not good, are they? If no, I do it that way... Ah. <laughs> well, these are light. There's one thing I invented. Yeah. There's one thing I invented, right? End it by catching it like that. This oh, is the yeah. one thing I... Do it with me. Do it with okay, me. Okay, so we're... So just like, juggle in and catch it like that we're if you like can. That. Yeah. Oops. Okay. Have a little drum roll for this. This is a three-part... A three-part move that I genuinely invented for myself, okay? Part number one. Drum roll, please. Okay. Do, do that with me. <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah. Part number two, drum roll, please. Holy oh, crap. <clears throat> I don't think I can. Okay, okay. Part number three, the final part, drum roll, please. I invented that. I, 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 I didn't tell you this backstage, but when I first started performing, when I was an uh, 18 and a half year old at Covent Garden, my first finale was Sink Plungers as well. Was it really? Yeah, it really was. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It's because it's, it's the thing that's it's, it's funny and you can buy them and it's a bit different. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. And also you can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dignity, always dignity. Always, yeah. Man who's been attacked by pacifist Red Indians. <laughs> Stuff like that. So that, that was, I mean, genuinely, you just, you just do things, and, and then, and then you strangely. get to a point where you go, oh, no, I'm bored of this, or I can't go further with this, um, so I'll change. And then, you, and then you do something different. That seems to be it for me. And it's weird, because it's an industry where if, it, if something's working, it's an industry where people go, do that again, do that again. I don't mean yeah. the audience, I mean, I mean like... You know, industry people yeah. want you. So every time I've written a book, the publisher's gone, can we have another book just like that? I go, no, that's boring. Yeah, if you shit. do one thing competently, yes. that's what they want you to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the question is then, how, how often do you get emails and tweets and stuff from people saying their name is Dave Gorman? Still. Um, all the bloody time. <laughs> I mean, like, 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 how many a week? And I try, because I mean, I'm aware that when, um, you know, I won't name the band, but I was, I was working on a thing once where a band were coming on and they were being paid very handsomely and they didn't want to sing their hit and we all thought they were, you know, oh, how terrible for them. It bought them their houses. Um, and I worry that if I sound like I'm too churlish about it, I will appear to be that guy right. who doesn't want... But I'm not. I'm really proud of it and it was a really lovely thing. It's just... I tried really hard. It was... I did a show called Reasons to be Cheerful and they offered me a TV thing and I said no... I did a show called Better World, and they offered me a TV thing. I said no. And then I did a show called I Dave Gorman, and it nearly bankrupted me. And they said, "Will you do it as a TV show?" And I said, "Yes, of course I will. I'm nearly bankrupt." So I sort of was sort of boxed into a corner with it. But in my head, it was, "Well, look, this is the third thing of this kind I've done. I do this kind of thing." And then I was offered a sequel for it, and I was offered all these weird things where, um, for those who I don't expect the world to know about it, it was a thing many years ago where I went looking for 54 people called Dave Gorman. And it was a true story that then became a TV thing. I didn't do it for TV. It, was, it became that. Um, and then I got offered all these weird things like sitcoms would want me to turn up as a... Ding dong! Hello, is anyone here called Dave Gorman? No, shut the door. And I thought, oh, if I do that... You know when David Dickinson was doing Bargain Hunt? And then he became a bit of a cult... And then people started, he was suddenly on adverts going, cheap as chips, cheap as chips, jingle, jangle, cheaper. I thought, I'll be that. Yeah. It'll be, it'll become, it was a true story. If I sell a fake version of it, yeah. then I'm, I'm, I'm boxed into a corner again where I'm that guy. I got offered, like, T-shirt deals, merchandise. I'm, are you Dave Gorman? I'm not. T-shirts and all this sort of stuff. And I just said no to all of it. My biggest, biggest, biggest regret, and I wish I'd said yes to this, I had a, a, my policy was just I said no to everything that was remotely connected to it so that I could refresh and say, no, I'm doing a new thing now. 
and I got offered uh, the first series of Who Do You Think, they, who do you, think you Are, the, the genealogical thing. Um, and it was, you know, now it's a massive series, and I'm not famous enough to be offered it again. Then it was a new series, and, the, and I was famous enough for a new series. Um, and, but the, the letter that came with it said, uh, having met all those Dave Gormans, I'm sure he'd be very interested in it. And I thought, no, policy, we say no to all those things. And now, I, oh, fuck, that was such a, what an amazing show to do. Wouldn't my parents have loved it if I had a fucking, you know, and I, that's my biggest regret, saying yeah. no to that, because that would have been amazing to do that show. I'd love to, to get into all that. Uh, but my policy was also no. And then 18 months, genuinely 18 months, in which I hardly worked because I said no to all those things, there was a letter in the Daily Mirror that said, I've had enough of this, Dave Gorman. All he ever does is talk about his namesakes. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't been on for six months. I've said no to everything. But it, it's like you just couldn't escape it. It was weird. And, I, and I'm very, very proud of it. But I get things like... I did a, I did a part in um, a film, 24-Hour Party People. It was a very small part. I played uh, John the Postman um, in this film. Um, and it was a very small part. My mum didn't even recognise me in it. They shaved me and put me in this costume uh, and stuff. But my name is in the credits. And when the film is on TV, I will get... Ten emails from strangers going, I found another Dave Gorman for you, he's in this film. <laughs> <laughs> that, what are the chances of that not being me? Come on, think about that. That's much more likely to be me than someone else. Yeah. But I, so it just, it just sort of goes on forever. Um, and I, I got, in the show, uh, five or six people changed their names. That was, that was in a bit that got broadcast. And they didn't change their names to be on TV because it wasn't a TV show at the time that that happened. But they we had a little video to make camera. Your th- crazy they they idea did it work. because the show was like a Methodist rally. Yeah. By the end of it, I would ask, "Is there anyone here called Dave Gorman?" And, and you'd feel the audience thinking, "I fucking hope there is." <laughs> and the show had two endings as, as a live show. If if they were there, they'd be happy, and it would be, and I'd just ride the crest of the wave out. And if they weren't. I would start offering them money to change their names, and, do, and we had different sort of two different ways it could go. And a lot of times, I would say, "Is there anyone prepared to change their name?" You'd feel someone on the wave of energy just going, "Yeah." And, and then they'd look really. How did, why did I do that? It was like it, 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 was, it was a Methodist rally. It had this really weird energy to it. And we, I used to take all their email addresses and, and follow it up. Most of them go, "No, <laughs> I don't know what I was doing. No, it was silly." But five, I think, five of them um, were true to it and went, "I actually want to." And I talked to them all about why, and, and they were really good reasons. Like, one guy is a guy in uh, Glasgow, and he said, I left school, I went straight into this job, it's a dead-end job, I'm stuck in a rut, I've been telling myself to make a change in your life and to do something dramatic and to change your outlook in life, and by doing this, this is the, the first day of the rest of my life. I'm now not that guy, I'm now a new guy, and, I, and, 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 that, and he now, he, he then, I don't know if he's still doing it, he started doing stand-up, and he had, to take it, he had to take his old name as his stage name. <laughs> because it would have been confusing. <laughs> but, but I liked his reason. I think that's a really sound reason. Yeah. And then when the show went out on TV, uh, people used to e- email me going, I'm going to change my name to Dave Gorman. And I'd email back going, you know, I'm not going to turn up with a camera crew. And they'd go, oh, all right, I won't bother then. <laughs> <laughs> it was just... There was one... Go- I, this, you have to forget, like, technology's changed. It was done in the days before Google, before that was... I mean, Google existed, but it didn't dominate our lives. It wasn't the go-to resource that it is today. And we didn't really use the internet to do it. Um, and then, uh, when it was on, when it first was on TV, and it was late night BBC2 with no trailers, so everyone who watched it found it by chance. Uh, I was in Melbourne at the Comedy Festival... And I didn't have a way of setting up my email there or anything. It was, you know, this, it, we weren't as internet-connected as we are today. So I'd, I'd left an auto-reply on my own email, and my email address was on my website. And I didn't realise that the show was going quite as well at home as it was. And I came home to an inbox with, like, 10,000 emails in it. And they were all assuming that the show was being... A lot of them were assuming that the show was being made week by week and that it was a thing they could interact with in the real moment, rather than a complete thing that had already been filmed. Um, so I, was get, I went through these emails, and one guy had sent me an email just going, I really love your show, I, you're my favourite comedian, this is amazing, please reply to me. 
to which he'd had an auto reply that said, thank you for your email, I'm currently in Melbourne at the Comedy Festival uh, in Australia, I will read all your emails, I apologise that I won't be able to reply to them all. And then he'd replied to that, saying, please reply, I really love you, I don't believe that you will read them all, prove that you will read them all by replying to this one. To which he received an auto reply saying, thank you very much for your email, I'm currently... And over a series of like five or six emails, he just turned. It was really, it just went from, you're my favourite, I love you, please reply, to you're a fake and a cunt. <laughs> and all he'd got was a polite auto reply along the way. And then there was this other woman, and it was lovely. They moved the very final episode because of the golf. And instead of doing what they should do, which was, for those tuning in to BBC Two to watch uh, the Dave Gorman collection uh, and finding the golf is on, don't worry, it'll be repeated tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Instead, they put a message up saying, for those tuning in to watch Dave Gorman collection on BBC Two, it was on yesterday. <laughs> oh. And it was the end of a story. So some people had invested six weeks, you know, they wanted to know how it ended. And I had this one, it was a lovely email this woman saying, thank you for your show, it's the first thing that me and my boys, my kids, have been able to watch together and we all laugh as a family. And that is just such a love... What I genuinely... I I can actually get silly and emotional just remembering reading this email. It made me so happy. And she said, and then they've moved it and I don't know what's going to happen and and how it ended and I want to know and please tell me, is there a way of of finding out what happened? And luckily, lots of people had said that and the BBC had been forced into into repeating it and they actually gave it its first ever trail... And I was so excited about that. So I got to do these like 10,000 emails, and I thought, these are the two extremes. I've got this woman saying this lovely thing, and this kid writing a semi-literate, you're a faker and a cunt, <laughs> having loved me five emails earlier. And I thought, these are the two I'm going to write back to. <laughs> uh, so I, I wrote back to him and said, and you can't spell, send. <laughs> And then I called her up and said, hello, because she'd left her numbers on there, and said, it's Dave Gorman here. Uh, I could tell you how it ends, but thank you, because thanks to people like you, they're repeating it. It's going to be on Saturday night, and and you can watch it anyway. And she was just like, you know, you've written an email to a weird BBC address or something. It had been forwarded to me. You don't expect the man in the show to ring you and go, thanks ever so much (laughs) for that. And I put that down. That that is fucking karma right there. I've dealt... (laughs) They bo- everyone got what they deserved in that. That feels really nice. It was lovely. Nice. Yeah, it was lovely. So I, I hadn't seen, until this week, I hadn't seen uh, Google Wag. OK, I'm, I'm getting a bit dry of throat. I'm just going to get that bottle of water, if that's oh, okay. OK. Sorry. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you very much. It was nice, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Can I also apologise to Maud, who I said I would do that after 30 seconds, and uh, we, we've I'm been a while. Yeah, it's recent. <laughs> but I did need it, sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, and and I, I, I don't know how many people have seen the Google Wack adventure, but it really struck me as an interesting one, because it, it looks like, with the greatest respect, it's a crazy adventure, but you basically have a breakdown halfway through it. It's, it's, it's really a true story of having a breakdown. Yeah. But I say that, and, and I don't mean it in a kind of so feel sorry for me. It's completely there for you to laugh at. It, it was done as a show. It, it redeemed itself by being a successful show. So this bad That's thing that happened that, turned yeah. into this very redemptive thing. And, I'm, and again, it's something I'm, I'm very proud of. But it is a true story, and it is about me having a breakdown. Yeah. And, and you're sort of confronted with the evidence in the middle of it. I was, I was going to bring this up, the idea of evidence in your work, because yes. this is... You know, people kind of, I guess, if people were going to do an impression of you, they would just get out <laughs> and, a they click do. and start and start <laughs> showing slides, you know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. the slides isn't a gimmick because that's, that's the evidence that what you're telling is a true story, isn't it? This is, here's what I'm telling you, and here's it happening. Yeah. Which is really key. Uh, you know, I think we're used to the idea that things said on a stage are fake. That thing Paul was talking about of, you know, a funny thing happened to me on the way here. As an audience, we suspend our disbelief. And we go, now, you know, tell us the joke that you've told a dozen times before, at least, about the funny thing that happened to you on the way here. Which is absolutely fine. But when the funny relies on it being true, you need proof mm. of it. It was a thing I discovered when I did that show, Reasons to be Cheerful. I, I, it was an accidental discovery. What happened, genuinely, my, my manager said, we, we're previewing that in March. And I did this thing in, in March uh, in the Battersea Arts Centre that was meant to be like an hour-long preview, and it lasted 90 minutes, and I'd only got through half of it. 
And part of it was I was going through the lyrics to the song, Ian Jury song, Reasons to be Cheerful, line by line, to decide whether or not they were reasons to be cheerful. Uh, and my theory was, I think there were 57 lines in the song. If I wrote a minute of jokes about each of the reasons, dealt with hello, goodbye, and the mobile phone that goes off in the 45th minute or whatever, then that's going to be an hour, and that'll be good for an Edinburgh show. Um, but the lyrics were quite hard to discern. And it wasn't, there wasn't an, an internet resource where you could just say, Ian Jury lyrics, reasons to be cheerful, and find it. They, they weren't online. So the second verse is kind of impenetrable when you're listening to it, and I heard people telling me different reasons, versions of what they thought the words were, and it was important to me, and I couldn't find them. Uh, so basically the second verse was missing in this preview. So I was on stage, and I'd done some jokes in the first stanza, and then I got into the second one, and I played it, and said, does anyone know what that is? No. Well, I'll tell you what I've done. I tried to find it, and I did this, and I went here. I went to the British Library, I did this, I spoke to this person. I managed to find an old smash hit. Uh, but they didn't have the February 1979 edition, which is the one it would have been in. And then it turns out, and, I, you know, and this long sort of story about how I'd finally found a copy of the lyrics. They, the publisher didn't have them, all this sort of stuff. And that true story was funnier than any of the jokes I'd put in. And you could feel this thing of, oh, the, the audience likes the true bit. That's nice. And I had the evidence as I was telling the story. It was in a different form. Um, and slowly the show turned from what I'd planned to be a minute of jokes about each of those lines became the story of the research I'd done into finding the evidence for these things. Um, and every time I took a joke out, the show got funnier. <laughs> <laughs> and having a joke in is so counterintuitive to a comic, and it's fairly young, and you just use these are your crutches, you need those jokes. And every time I took a joke out, the audience believed it more. And every time you put a joke in that was obviously a joke, the audience went, all right, you make stuff up to make us laugh now we don't believe this next bit. And now that next bit isn't as funny. So every time you took those out, they lost their, their crutch. Their, oh, you're making this up for our entertainment is a kind of nice thing for an audience. And so they were a bit more off balance and a bit, but God, this must be fucking true because there's no jokes in it. It must be true. <laughs> and that made all the, all the true and funny things much funnier because mm. they, they didn't think, oh, no, you've made that bit. They just really like, hooked into it. And it was hor I went through these previews where I was literally going, I'm going to be brave tonight, I'm going to take out another five jokes. And I think by the end of it, there was one joke left. And it was <laughs> much funnier. And I used to measure the funniness in the show. I used to have, um, like, a, you know, the climbers who chalk, a little bag for their or weightlifter in a little pouch there. I had one of those, which was full of marbles. And I used to wear it full of marbles. There'd be a little glass jar on the stage. And I wouldn't tell people what I was doing, but if I got a laugh, and I did it for my own, genuine, for my own sort of knowledge at the beginning of the process, if I got a big laugh, I'd drop in like three or four marbles. If I got a little laugh, I'd drop in a couple. If it went badly, I'd take a couple out. And you could see it would obviously perplex the audience as this was happening throughout the night. And at the end, I used to explain what it had been about and weigh the, the marbles and tell them how many grams of laughter we'd had that night. LAUGHTER um, and they'd laugh at that, so I'd add more in. And, and then I had a, a, a bar graph showing how it had started at sort of 250 grams. And by the time I got to Edinburgh, it was over a kilo. Um, and it was going great guns. But it was, it was a genuine measure of how funny it was. And I had this genuine sort of chart going, wow, you took a joke out tonight. And it went from 800 to 850. I said, that's brilliant. I, I, actually, I measured the laughter in that show. Night after night, and, and it, was, it was a weird thing. But that was the foundation of that, and all the, the next two or three shows were just tell the truth. Just, yeah. just you know, tell the funniest version of the truth. You know, punctuate it as well as you can. Get to the surprise them, pull the rug from underneath them. And, stuff. and, and audiences are lovely if they care... And that's the thing with Google Whack, because the audience would be... You, there's evidence along the way where you go, oh, God, he clearly hasn't done this to entertain us because yeah. of bad things happened to him <laughs> that, a sane, that no one would have... God, shit, that's real. And they'd start to care about you. And the minute they really care about you, it goes back to that kind of mock earnestness of all the names have been changed to protect you or something. There's that kind of, like, we're off balance now, we're caring, mm. and it's really easy to then be flippant or trivial and sort of nudge them off balance and then they laugh again. And it's sort of... You can play with their emotions as well as their brains. Yeah. It's, a, it's, I, a, it's a nice thing. I think it's also really powerful in that show that people's perception is that if you're a man off the television, you're rich and everything's fine. <laughs> and, but, you know, that's the... You know, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, you're yeah. fine, you know. And, and in, that, in that show, you do kind of go, I'm not fine, I've got no money, and I'm really out of my depth, and I'm being, I'm being a bit mad. I think that's 
for an audience to see someone on TV being that vulnerable makes it really... You've you know, just reminded me of a thing I was talking to Paul uh, about before. Uh, we share a, a distaste for the business of psychics and, and people. Uh, yes. And <laughs> uh, many years ago, I did a show. It was, it was not a very good show. I did a show about astrology uh, for BBC Two. A show where I followed my horoscopes. And I, I don't... It's the show I'm least proud of because it's the most contrived because it, it only exists to be a thing on TV. It didn't have a it, reality behind it, underpinning it. But we made it. And when I was publicising it, I did a thing with a tabloid uh, newspaper. It was a very soft bit of PR. A photographer, me, a journalist and a PR person went to visit three psychics for a colour f- feature in the back of a Sunday magazine... Uh, where three different psychics, one did tarot, one did crystal ball, one read my aura or whatever, uh, and they all gave me a a reading. And I was amazed, because they all knew I was promoting a TV series for BBC Two. There's a young man who's promoting a uh, new series on BBC Two, can you give him a psychic reading, we're going to see what he thinks of you, was a setup. And here's a journalist and a photographer, so no secret underhand anything going on. And they all have scripts, I think, in their head, because most people who go to them are worried about their health, their love life, or their finances. So they, I think they assess you, they go, how old are you, what's it likely to be, he's young, it won't be health, okay, it's either love, life or money, whatever. And all three of them started by going, so, very nice to meet you, David, um, I'm getting something very powerful from you, are you, are you having money worries? Yeah. No, I'm promoting a series on BBC Two. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing all right. I've got my own telly show. <laughs> That's the worst guess in the world. Yeah. You had an email from a tabloid newspaper saying, will you do this thing to help promote this guy's show on TV? You must know people get paid for making TV. <laughs> That's the worst. What do you, you, you're, how bad could you be at this? <laughs> Go for something else. I mean, you could have just said, are you worried about something coming? Yes, I am. I'm very nervous that the show I've made isn't very good. That would have been a good guess, but money worries at that time. I've had them since and before, but right then, not, not the issue. Mm. Very odd. So, yes, people do think that, apart, uh, apart from psychics. Yes. <laughs> OK, we, we are sadly running a little yes, late. Yes, sorry. So yes. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up, but I have, I have one final question for you. Yes. Is it true that there's a character in Neighbours named after you? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, he was in two episodes. In fact, there have been characters in two different Australian soap operas named Dave Gorman, in my honour. Uh, I did the show in Melbourne. Writers came to see it uh, when I was doing it. And as an in-joke, they named a character Dave Gorman. Uh, he was in two episodes. Uh, he's, he appears very briefly. Um, it was very, very peculiar being me that day. Because, again, you told you, you know, how many emails I get when... I appear in a film mm. <laughs> telling... I got, like, 8,000 emails in a day the day he appeared on, on screen because it was quite close to when I'd done it as well in time. Uh, the weird giveaway, you can see it's an in-joke because he is only ever addressed by both names. <laughs> so what happened in the story was Harold took him in. He was a, a waif and stray. He was an orphan. Uh, and Harold showed kindness to him and, and let him come to live with him. And then uh, the next night, a bike got stolen. And all of the people of Erinsborough went, oh, that'll be that new kid, that naughty boy, who's just, he shouldn't have taken in that way from Stray. He's an orphan, he's an heir, do well. Mm." And they all blamed him. And so he ran away. And then it turned out that it wasn't him. And they all felt very bad about themselves. Uh, but Harold would be like, introducing him to the other characters, and it would be Carl, this is Dave Gorman, Dave Gorman, this is Carl, uh, Sarah, this is Dave Gorman, Dave Gorman, this is Sarah. You think, nobody else has got a surname. Why does he? <laughs> it was just the most obvious kind of, see what we're doing. Uh, there's one man in England who's going to fucking love this. So, yes, I have that weird, distinct honour. Brilliant. Well, I'm afraid I have to wrap it up. Uh, it's a pleasure. We're running over. It's been an absolute pleasure, Mr David Gorman. <laughs> Thank you.